Hi everyone, my name is David London and I'm the Chief Experience Officer at The Peel. And allow me to be the first to welcome you to today's Juneteenth celebration, Stories of Freedom, in partnership with the Grio Circle of Maryland. Today's event will last just under one hour and includes ASL interpretation as well as live transcriptions. I would like to thank our interpreter who you see here beside me, as well as our transcriber who is working today behind the scenes. If you need any help with accessibility or have any accessibility suggestions, you can email us at access at thepeelcenter.org. The best way to view this program, along with its accessibility features, is on the Peel's website at www.thepeelcenter.org backslash live. For those of you who are currently watching from the Peel's website, live captions can be seen in the stream text reader located directly beneath the video player. Also on the website, to the right of the video, there is a chat box, which we encourage you to use to leave comments and engage in the conversation. We also have viewers today joining us via Facebook Live, as well as listening by phone. If you are joining us by phone, we ask that you please keep yourself muted. While we certainly don't expect any complications, in the event of any technical difficulties or unforeseen circumstances during today's broadcast, please watch the chat box to your right or your email for further instructions. If you need any technical help with today's broadcast, you can email us at online at thepeelcenter.org. You can also reach us on social media. We are at The Peel on Twitter and Facebook and The Peel Baltimore on Instagrams. And these handles are also being shared in the comment box on the live viewing page. The Peel is based in downtown Baltimore in the oldest museum building in America, opened in 1814. After sitting vacant for nearly 20 years, The Peel recently came back to life as a center for Baltimore stories. Our building is currently undergoing renovation and we are in the final moments of our capital campaign. If you would like to support our efforts to bring the building back to life, you can find more information at thepeelcenter.org backslash campaign. We would also like to invite you all to mark your calendars for August 15th for our Founders Day celebration, when we celebrate the Peel's 207th birthday. And we will also be celebrating the birthday of the Peel's storyteller in residence, Mama Linda Goss, who is also the co-founder of the National Association of Black Storytellers, a member of the Griot Circle of Maryland, and the first storyteller you will be hearing from in our program today. If you wish to make a donation today directly to the Griot Circle of Maryland, if you're watching on the Peel's website, you can find a donate button to the right of the video player. You can also learn more at griotscircleofmarylandinc.org. We would also like to thank WYPR 881 for their sponsorship of this event. And now we begin this event by acknowledging with humility that the lands where the Peel and Baltimore is situated today are the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of Piscataway, Lenape, and Susquehannock indigenous peoples. The vast coastal area today known as Baltimore City, Maryland, sustained indigenous peoples until the arrival of Europeans beginning in the 1600s. Over the next 400 years, many Piscataway, Lenape, and Susquehannock communities were decimated, absorbed by larger villages or tribes, and or forced by the U.S. federal government to move west beyond the Mississippi River with larger tribes. Since then, other tribal peoples have moved here in diaspora, including Lumbee peoples. On January 9th, 2012, two tribes of Piscataway, the Piscataway Kanoi tribe and the Piscataway Indian Nation, became the first tribes recognized by the state of Maryland. In 2017, the state also recognized the Akahanic Indian tribe. We acknowledge that the Peel stands on stolen lands. And I would also like to acknowledge that this history was adapted from an original text and author our thanks to the authors, Ryan A. Coons, Peter Dayton, and Ashley Minner of the Lumbee tribe. And now I would like to introduce someone who it has been an absolute pleasure to work with to make today's event come to life. Please join me in welcoming the Vice President of the Grio Circle of Maryland, Sister Martha Ruff. Welcome. 
to the Grio Circle of Maryland Juneteenth celebration, along with a part in partnership with the Peel Museum. My name is Sister Martha Ruff, and I am the Vice President of the Grio Circle of Maryland. I bring you greetings from our current president, Karen Burnell, and we remember our founder, Mother Grio Mary Carter Smith. We are blessed to be able to continue her legacy. And we know that one of those things is keeping alive the traditions of African Americans. And one of those traditions is the celebration of Juneteenth. June 19th, 1865, when African Americans in Galveston, Texas were told that they were free. We celebrate because we want to remember that we always wanted to be free. Wherever we were, we wanted the freedom to live in harmony and to be able to share with our community. And so on Saturday mornings in Baltimore, you would hear Mother Mary Carter Smith say that rhyme about the griots. The griots were those who sang the praise songs, told the stories, recited the poetry, and shared everything that was good with everyone in the family. And that's what we're going to do today in celebrating Juneteenth. So get ready to participate in your own homes wherever you are. Get out your shaker rays. Get out your noisemakers. And be ready to enjoy some of the best storytelling around. We'll start off with a special guest, Brother Abu the Flute Maker, who will share with you music from his own creation. He makes instruments from all kinds of things. And then, Griot Janice Curtis Green will bring us a powerful presentation of Harriet Tubman. And one of the biggest supporters of the Griot Circle has been Congressman Kwaisi Fume, who will tell us a little bit about, about Juneteenth. He began with Mother Mary Carter Smith at the radio station at Morgan University, and he has been gracious enough to show miss Gordon Park's portrayal of Langston Hughes. And then have some fun, get up, dance, as Griot Bob Smith tells us about the cakewalk. Oh, it's not time to sit down yet. Ophelia Brown Carter brings us a flying story that will set you free. And don't forget the children. William Stark tells us about how children have made a difference in our history. And so get ready to enjoy Juneteenth, a celebration of freedom, stories of freedom. It's time to celebrate freedom. My bells are ringing, well, well, well. My soul is singing, well, well. I am the bell ringer. I am the praise singer. I am the truth weller. I am the storyteller. Well, oh, well, well. It's storytelling time. In celebration of Juneteenth, we come together. Now, before I continue, I ask permission from the elders of the Griot Circle to speak. Oh, blessed elders, 
Do I have your permission to continue? Asante sana, asante sana. I feel your affirmation. Peace and blessings. Peace and blessings. We come together on this Juneteenth to celebrate. For we are children. We are babies of ancestors who survived the Middle Passage, also known as the Atlantic enslavement trade. Our ancestors survived so we can so we can survive. Let us have a moment of silence mm-hmm. and praise and thanks to Sante Sana. Giving thanks. Recognition, remembrance to the almighty creator, the maker and shaper of all things. A moment of silence, please. Mm -hmm. A moment of silence for the indigenous people of the land, the indigenous people of this place we call Maryland and this town we call Baltimore. A moment of silence for these stolen lands that were labored by our people, labored by stolen people. A moment of silence, please. Ashe, Ashe, we remember, we respect, and we recognize. We remember, we reclaim, we recall the ancestors' names. A moment of silence for all the ancestors of the griot circle a moment of silence for mama nana our ancestral queen mother mary carter smith ashe 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 let us remember those within our own families our loved ones that we have lost this year ashe 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 let us Call out now. Call out. Call out the name of the ancestor you want to remember. Call. Call. Call their names. Call. Call their names. We remember. We reclaim. We recall the ancestors' names. Asante Sana. Asante Sana. Peace, hope, and love be with all of you. The winds of God have spoken. May the circle of love be unbroken. got long to stay here. Good afternoon to you. Allows me to introduce myself to you. My name be Hyatt Ross Tubman Davis. And I was here to tell you a little bit about my life. See, I was born, oh, about 1820, 1822, in a dark time in this country history, where people that look like me, colored folks, were stolen away from a continent across the big waters 
and brought here just to be kept in chains. We was enslaved, we was sold, we was beaten, worked hard from can to can. That mean from the time you can't see your hand in front of you till it's so dark you can't. And I, had Tubman, was kept in bondage. Now when I was born, I was born and I, I belonged to Mr. Edward Brodus on the Brodus Plantation where my mama had green lived. My daddy at that time belonged to Mr. Thompson and he lived on the Thompson Plantation. Later on, my daddy was able to purchase his freedom and long time after that, he actually purpose, purchased my mama freedom too. Well, when I was born, my name wasn't Harriet Tubman, no sir. My name was Araminta Ross. I say, Daddy, what Araminta mean? He said, Araminta is a name that come from a place across the big water. It mean protector. I say, Daddy, how I gonna protect anybody? He said, when I tell you these things like how to read the stars and, and, and what you can eat and can't eat in the woods, you take all them things, put them in your spirit place so you can take it out later. I was telling you this, children, when you learn things when you're little, you members them and put them in your spirit place because you're going to need them when you grows up. Now, when I was a little girl, all I wore was a toe gown, which is a burlap sack. And the children didn't have to work almost. But I tell you this, one day Mr. Broders come up and tell me he was going to loan me out. You say, Aunt Harriet, how you loan out a person? That's when a man would own slave, rent his slaves out to somebody what don't. And he get paid all the money. You does the work, he get paid the money. Mr. Bodas powerful mean. He sold away some of my sisters, Leah, Soph, and Mariah, when they was just little. And my mama cried and cried, but he done it anyway. Then me, he loaned out. He rented me to the cooks, where I, I almost caught pneumonia and died because I was walking around in the, in the swamp with just my toe gown on. Then he rent me out to this mean white lady who beat me just because I let her baby cry. I was just a baby myself, only about seven, eight years old. My teeth was missing. That's how come they knowed how old I was. Well, after all of that, I decided I'm going to work hard on the plantation so he don't rent me out no more. And I worked hard in the fields with the boys and the men, and I grew, grew strong. Then one time when I was only about 12 years old, we were shucking corn, having a shucking corn contest between Mr. Barrett Darkey and Mr. Broder's Darkey. And I saw as an old boy, he was trying to run away. I was curious like any child gonna be. So I followed him all the way about a mile to the Bucktown store. And when he went in that front door and out the back, the overseer said to me, Minty, stop it. And I remember my daddy say, my name mean protector. And I reach in that spirit place and I kept blocking the door. <gasps> the overseer gets so mad with me. He pick up a lead weight and he throwed it across the room and it hit me in my head, cracked my skull open. I almost died again, but my mama, who, who was a healer, nursed me back to health. But from that point on, two things happened. When I was in that coma, that's when you, you can't wake up because you're so sick in your body healing yourself. The good Lord started talking to me and he revealed to me that I was going to be free. The other thing that happened from that point on was I had headaches and sleeping sickness and, and I was always sickly. Well, I decided that I was going to be free. And I had reasoned it out in my mind that there was two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I was going to have the other. For no man was going to take me alive. I would fight for my freedom with my last breath. When it was time for me to go, only the good Lord himself would take me. And I growed up and <laughs> even though we enslaved, we fall in love. And I married a man whose name was John Tubman. And when you get married, you can't have a child named like Minty. That when I changed my name to Harriet. I want to be called a name like my mama. See, children, when you're looking to be somebody famous and you want to take a new name, and you need not look any further than across the dinner table to your parents that put food in your mouth and clothes on your back. They the people you should be like. Well, even after I was married to a free man, I knowed I wanted to be free. 
See, Mr. Brodus had died and, and Miss Elijah, his wife, was selling off his slaves and I thought me and my brothers was going to be sold off. So I planned to run away, but my brothers got scared and dragged me back. Mr. Tubman didn't want to go. My brothers didn't want to go. So I, Harriet Tubman, ran out by myself, enslaved, little, dark, can't read no right always sick, but I decided that I wasn't going to let nothing stop me, and I got my freedom. I went to Philadelphia, and that's where I become a part of the Underground Railroad. Taint a train, taint underground. It's a secret A colored folk, white folk, free folk that made sure that, the, that they would keep going back and free folks who was enslaved. I went back 13 times. And I freed all of my sisters and brothers and my parents, except my big sister, Rachel, who had died before I could get her. Sometime I had to take folk all the way up to Canada where it was cold. Anybody say they want to go back, I say, you be free or die. After Civil War break out, that's the, when the states from up north wanted to free them slaves, and, and the states from the south wanted to keep them darkies. Well, we fought. And I fought alongside the, the soldiers in the Union Army. After a while, the Civil War over, the slaves was free, but there was so much fighting to do. I fought for women to get the right to vote. I used to bring people into my house in Auburn, New York, old people, young people, and I took care of them. Members this, my children. It ain't about how much you have in life that make you special in the eyes of the law. You're special when you do things to help other people. I ain't never had nothing, but I had in my heart the desire to help other people. And that's what Harriet Ross Tubman Davis leaves with you today. And I thank you. Hi, I'm Congressman Kwaisi Mfume, representing Maryland's 7th Congressional District. And for me, it is indeed an honor today to have been given the pleasure of joining with you and others and speaking to you about Juneteenth, a holiday that began in the final throes of what historian John Hope Franklin once described as the peculiar institution of American slavery. Fortunately, over many years of effort, it became nationally recognized and finally spread worldwide. So when I think about Juneteenth and what it means to me, I often marvel at the growth of the day itself. Oftentimes our society does not fully appreciate how significant these moments in history are until the passage of time makes it clear just how important a part of our history they truly were. This holiday, also known as Emancipation Day, traces its roots back to Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865, because it was on that date that Union soldiers were finally able to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation signed by President Lincoln when liberating forces publicly read General Order Number no. 3, which established freedom, freedom for all remaining enslaved people, effective immediately. That story, rarely published at the time, was told over and over again in our communities through the oral tradition in an effort to preserve its relevance for future generations of African Americans. And it is on that note that I'd like to acknowledge and thank the co-founder of the National Association of Black Storytellers, Linda Goss, or Mama Goss, as she is affectionately known, who first developed an interest in the oral tradition when she was a young high school student, when she realized after interviewing her own grandfather that the folklore and the family tales he shared with her needed to be preserved for the future and not lost in the cracks and crevices of history. What a difference that tiny decision made in her life and what a difference it has made in the griot legacy in America. Similarly, the late Mary Carter Smith, who was known as America's mother griot, was a personal friend and a teacher in the Baltimore City Public School system for 30 years. She then dedicated herself full-time to the art of storytelling and among other achievements, became the producer and presenter of Grio for the young and the young at heart, a radio program that I had the pleasure of hiring her for in 1977 at radio station WEAA 
that popularly ran for every Saturday for many, many years up until the time of her death. Mary devoted her life to cultivating connections across humanity. She once said that I am among those who fight misunderstanding, but the weapons I use are stories, drama, songs, poetry, and laughter. And finally, let me say that it has been 25 years since my former colleague in Congress, Barbara Rose Collins, first introduced legislation to recognize Juneteenth Independence Day. And in the quarter of century that has passed, awareness and recognition of this very special day has grown rapidly. And finally, we must always remember as well that it was the tireless efforts of organizations like the Grio Circle of Maryland that helped to make all of this happen. Congratulations to all and happy Juneteenth. Well, hello everyone. Let me introduce myself to you. My name is Langston Hughes. And for all of you who may not know, I was one of the great Negro writers back uh, during the Harlem Renaissance between the mid 1920s through the mid 1930s. Now I was born 1902 in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, my parents divorced and uh, I was sent to live with my grandmother in the Midwest. I remember as a child always loving to read books and writing poetry. Uh, in fact, uh, in high school, I was uh, recognized as an up and coming poet. Uh, later, I moved uh, to Mexico to live with my father. Uh, that wasn't a great idea. You see, my father was a businessman with materialistic values, and he felt that just writing about anything was just a waste of time. So then I moved to DC, where I became a bus boy and I continued my writing. However, it wasn't until around 1921, when I moved to New York City, Harlem to be exact, that's when I really developed my skill as a great writer. Ah, Harlem. That was a place that was just full of dreams. Uh, some dreams realized and some dreams deferred. A dream deferred. Hmm. What is a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a saw and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? <laughs> that was Harlem, inspirational. I loved Harlem, but I also loved to, to travel. Uh, throughout the states, and, and, and I loved to travel around the world, lived on just about every continent, and every time writing down those experiences and, and creating poems. Uh, this next poem uh, has, has uh, begun to be known as uh, my signature poem, and it's called The Negro Speaks of Rivers. I've known rivers. I've known Rivers as ancient as the world, older than the flow of human blood through human veins. My soul runs deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when the, when the dawn was young. I, I built my hut by the Congo and it lured me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and, and built the pyramids above it. I heard the, the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient dusty rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. 
Yes, I, I love to travel and write about my experiences. You know, one thought comes to mind, uh, uh, and that was when I, I went to Baltimore. I went to Baltimore to see the arena players put on uh, uh, my a production of Simply Heavenly. Great production. And I also remember this lovely lady that I met there. She was, uh, oh, she was an actress. Uh, she was a teacher, she was a poet, and a, a wonderful, wonderful storyteller. And her name was Mary Carter Smith. I remember that. And, and we kept correspondence for a, a long period of time, writing each other postcards and letters. But through it all, I, I, I just had to get back to Harlem. See, Harlem was, that was where the, the, the people was. I mean, they inspired me. Uh, I, I just loved their mannerisms, the way they walked, the way they talked, uh, their dress, uh, the way they sang, uh, the music. And then I just wrote about all the aspects of, of living in Harlem. And I, I wrote about the murders in the streets, the funerals. I, I wrote about the jazz singers in the nightclubs and, and those gospel singers. Uh, uh, in those storefront churches uh, on Sunday morning. And, and everybody knew how to get to Harlem because all you had to do was take the A train. <laughs> ah! And oh yeah, once you took the A train, everything opened up to you. <sighs> it inspired me to write this next poem that I called uh, the ballot of the landlord. Landlord, landlord, my roof didn't sprung a leak. Don't you remember I told you about that way last week? 10 bucks you say I owe you. 10 bucks you say is due. Well, that's 10 bucks you ain't gonna see till you fix my house up new. What? So you gonna get eviction orders? Count off my heat. You say you're going to throw my furniture out in the street? Uh-huh, you talking high and mighty. Talk on till your talk is true. Because you ain't going to be able to say a word once I lay my fist on you. Police, police, come and get this man. He trying to run the government and overturn the land. Copper's whistle, Simon bell, arrest, precinct station, Hans Sell, uh, headlines and press. Man threatens landlord. Uh, uh, tenant held, no bail. Judge gives Negro 90 days in the county jail. <laughs> that, that was Harlem. There was always something going on in Harlem. I mean, Bad things sometimes, but mostly good things. And see, I came through at a time when, when I was surrounded by all of these great, uh, prolific Negro writers. Sadly to say, some of them disappeared, uh, well, after 1930. But I continue to write. I continue to write about the Negro awareness and the Negro consciousness. Always a poem. I, too. I too sing America. I am the darker brother that they send to eat in the kitchen when company comes. I laugh, I eat well, and I grow strong. Tomorrow, I will sit at the table when company comes. And no one will dare say to me, then uh, eat in the kitchen for they'll be ashamed and see how beautiful I am. Yes, I too am America. Yeah, I continue to write and, uh, and I continue to dream, dream that one day things will get better. And not just for me, but, but for all of my Negro brethren. And I continue to pray. I pray that one day our dream would not be deferred, but would be realized by everyone 
and passed on from generation to generation. We too need to keep that dream and we need to keep that struggle for freedom alive. Thank you for listening and may God bless. Have you ever wondered who wrote the song, Straighten Up and Fly Right? Well, it was written by Nat King Cole. He was inspired by a sermon that his father preached in their church. The story goes like this. On a very hot summer day, there was an old buzzard flying around looking for something to eat. He had been flying a long time and hadn't found a thing. And then suddenly that sharp eye saw a rabbit down in the grass trying to get cool. So he flew down and sat beside the rabbit. And he said, good afternoon. He was all friendly. How are you feeling today? And the little rabbit said, well, I'm just so hot. I just don't know what to do. I just wish I could find someplace cool to rest. And that old buzzard said to the rabbit, well, it's cool where I come from. Why don't you take a ride with me? And the little uh, rabbit didn't know what to think of that. Those little floppy ears perked up. And the rabbit looked at the buzzer. Well, buzzer did look cool and he did look comfortable. But that little rabbit said to the buzzard, now, from what I know and from what I've been told, it's hotter up there close to the sun. Well, that old cunning buzzard had an answer for everything. And finally, he convinced that little rabbit to take that ride. Rabbit gets on its back and up they fly, flying around in the sky. By the time he thinks the rabbit is all cool and comfortable, he makes a dive straight down to the earth and then zooms back up high speed. That poor little rabbit falls off his back and he has rabbit for lunch. Now, I tell you, what I've heard, rabbit is pretty good eating for folk that like it. Now on the next day, old buzzard was looking for food and he's flying all around, just flying and flying and flying and he saw a little squirrel down on the ground. Little squirrel gathering his nuts, just jetting back and forth, and trying to keep cool too. So the buzzard zooms down and sits beside the squirrel. Now he was a real gentleman. Good afternoon, sir. How are you feeling today? And the little squirrel says, well, I'm so hot. I just don't know what to do. And the squirrel was just fanning and just trying to get cool. That buzzard said, well, it's cool where I come from. Why don't you take a ride with me? And the squirrel says, okay, and jumps on the buzzard's back, and up they go, flying, just flying, his wide, massive wings, just flying. About time he thinks that squirrel is cool, zoom down to the ground and back up. And that poor little squirrel falls off his back. He has squirrel for dinner. Now, I want you to know in the meantime, there was a little monkey up in the trees watching everything that old buzzard did. He watched him play those tricks on that squirrel. And he watched him the day before when he played the trick on that rabbit. He knew that buzzard would be back the next day. So he was watching and waiting for him. Yeah, buzzard had to find food. So the next day he was out flying, flying. 
Little monkey see him and he gets all out in the opening, want to make sure the buzzard sees him. Buzzard does and Buzzard zooms down and sits beside the monkey. Good afternoon, sir. How are you feeling today? And the monkey says, oh, I'm just so hot. And that monkey just lays it on and fanning and carrying on. That's all that buzzard wanted to see. So the buzzard says, well, it's cool where I come from. Why don't you take a ride with me? And the monkey says, okay, and gets on his back. Up they go, flying. By the time he think that monkey is cool, he tries that power dive. He starts down and that you won't believe what happens next. That monkey takes his tail and wraps it around that buzzard's neck and the buzzard holler, ah, 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 you're choking me. That monkey say to that buzzard, well, straighten up and fly right. You won't have no monkey for dinner tonight. Now, I tell you, I can't sing like Nat King Cole, and I wouldn't even try, but I do have the lyrics to his song, and it goes like this. The buzzer took the monkey for a ride in the air. The monkey thought that everything was on the square. The buzzer tried to throw the monkey off his back. The monkey grabbed his neck and said, now listen, Jack, straighten up and fly right. 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 A right. cool down, Papa, don't you blow your top. Now ain't no sense in diving. What's the use of your jiving? Just straighten up and fly right. Now that buzzer told that monkey, you're choking me. Release your hole and I'll set you free. Well, that monkey looked that buzzer dead in the eye and said, your story is touching, but it sounds like a lie. Straighten up and fly right. Straighten up and fly right. Straight in up and fly right. Oh, cool down, Papa, don't you? Blow your top. Now I say, don't try to trick me. You just keep on flying until I tell you to stop. And if you don't, I'll give you a bop. So cool down, Papa. Don't you blow your top. Now, that monkey is free, free, free. Flippity flap, that's the end of that. You know, if you're gonna celebrate something like Juneteenth, well, you got to have a gathering. You, you gather at Emancipation Park in Houston, for instance, and you wanna have food. Uh, Uncle Bobby's barbecue, sis, uh, Susie's, Rolls, Susie always makes rolls, and a cake, if you can, a, a cake from uh, Miss uh, Glenda Atkinson, she makes some wonderful cake, and um, what you're going to do is have a cakewalk, a cakewalk's kind of a competition, you have uh, people who, who uh, dance in couples, and until you, you, you separate them until you get one couple. And whoever is that one couple takes the cake. Now, uh, my grandmother used to say that, that I took the cake. And I wonder about that. I never knew if it was good or bad, because she said, you take the cake when I covered myself in red paint from the head all the way down to my feet. Well, she said, you take the cake when I'd recite a poem. And all the aunties would say, oh, you're a wonderful speaker. You're going to be a preacher when you grow up. I didn't know. But she'd always say you take the cake. And I found out that's because that's the prize in the cake walk, a cake. You have couples, and everybody get out on the floor in the 
This was the year of the Children's Crusade in May of that year. Who were the children? These were children of elementary and high school ages. Why were they in the streets? Because they were tired of not being treated as full citizens in these United States. So in Birmingham, Alabama, on those city streets, these youngsters were parading and chanting that they wanted their freedoms. They wanted to be treated as full citizens, not second class. So they were marching and singing and protesting the way that things were at that time. Why were they out there with themselves? Their mothers must have been frantic at home, but they did allow them to go because they thought it was going to be a nice, peaceful thing. Not so for the authorities. They went out and brutalized those children with water hoses from the fire department. Can you imagine that, being hit in the back by the force of water from a fireman's hose? Knocked them to the ground. But that was not the worst. They also had canine dogs that they would sick on the children. You would see pictures of them ripping the clothes from the people. Young boys being brutalized in that manner just because they wanted to be recognized as full citizens in these United States. 1963. That was an important year to me as well. It was the year I graduated from college that may. So I had been on those lines. Remember the sit-ins at all the restaurants? Woolworths, all those places? We did that out of Norfolk State. These youngsters were exercising their rights as well. The right to protest, which is a true American right. And yet they were being brutalized by the very authorities who should have been protecting them. Maddie Harris was so outraged at the sight of this young man being attacked by a dog that she went out and grabbed him to try to pull him away. What did the policemen do? They grabbed her as well, took her and imprisoned her for eight days. She was in with a number of other youngsters who were also in prison. No mattresses, hardly any food. Eight days, eight days. That October, I received my draft notice. Imagine that. In a country that would not allow me to be a citizen full-heartedly, would send me to fight their wars. And the Vietnam War was one of the worst, because it was not one in which we should have been involved. So what do we do? We support the children. We support ourselves. We join the lines. We protest. And we demand that we be recognized as full citizens. 
We're fighting that battle today, all over again. Seemingly, it never ends. Do your part. Protest. Write letters. Whatever you're able to do, let the world know that you want to be recognized as a full citizen here in these United States, along with those children in 1963 in the Children's Crusade. <laughs>